lot of partnerships to make this work. But it also sounds like you had a tremendous amount of local government buy-in. Yeah. <coughs> changes, um, city ordinance changes. How did that happen? So uh, the benefit of being in a community for 25 years is you get to know your elected leaders. And so I had a pretty good relationship with most of our city councilors and the mayor. Um, and then the second, I, I mentioned that car camp that, that, that went bad in the mid-90s. And I knew that that was a big uh, roadblock we had to get over. Um, so I lined up the head of Catholic Community Services, the head of Shelter Care, which is an organization that provides a specialized program to mention the brain injury, dealing with people with mental illness and the like. And then most importantly, the head of St. Vincent de Paul. So the four of us appear on a panel before the city council with a well-written out plan of how we were going to run this and ask for the city council support. We got that support on a six to two vote uh, for uh, one year. Um, the land that we're on is city-owned land and uh, for a dollar a year. And um, then uh, when it came up for renewal, I wasn't even at the meeting. Um, a counselor made a motion to extend it for a year and a half uh, because she said it doesn't make any sense to end this lease in the middle of winter. Let's give it to them until the summer of 2016. And um, that passed unanimously, eight to zero. Um, so that's with the creation of Opportunity Village. With the rest stops, it was a little bit harder um, but just the same kind of process of convincing the city um, that this was the right thing to do and that bringing people together in a camp like this would be much less costly than allowing, you know, and just dealing with sanitation issues. And you can see how well they're organized. So, so it, just a lot of conversation with our elected leaders and lining up that support from them is, is really the key. Just a quick question. Uh, Could you stand, please? Couldn't hear you better. When the inclement weather comes through, where do you go? So these units are not heated, and they will be in the Emerald Village, but in Opportunity Village, they're not heated. So the yurt, I don't know, there was one picture, I think I, you may have seen the yurt. It has a wood, a pellet stove in it. Uh, so they decided that whenever, and this, again, because it's a self-governed community, right? So we left it to them, and they decided whenever the Egan Warming Center is open, the yurt will be open. And so anyone who wants to come in where there's heat is welcome to do so. Uh, only about half of the residents have chosen to do that. Uh, the rest heat up a water bottle, take something warm up in the bed, have really good sleeping bags and blankets. And because these units are all well insulated uh, and such a small volume of air, they actually do okay. Um, well, whenever the wind is powerful. Yeah, well, it doesn't happen too often, but, but you know, uh, they just hunker down where they are. Yeah, yeah we haven't had any yes. major storms, but snow and cold weather has been the, the biggest problem. Yes, yeah. I wanted to share a comment, and also a question related to the government. Uh, what, are you aware that HDTV has a protocol on the tiny houses, and they take the stigma off of uh, living in tiny houses? HDTV is a Oh, yeah, it's really become the fad. Yeah, yeah, right now. But most of what they're showing is the high-end tiny houses. People who have money want to build a really cool tiny house and not doing it as affordable housing. But yeah, it's become a huge fad. And that's precisely, we're writing that wave. I mentioned the 2015 residential code. Most states have not yet adopted that code. Uh, but our city is willing to allow us to build according to that code because it's a higher code than what the state has. But that 2015 code specifically allows for people to build these tiny houses. Under the previous code, you cannot build anything under 400 square feet. But with the new code, they've taken off uh, that uh, minimum requirement to make it much easier to build small. And my other question, I have a question. How are you keeping your government from going after real estate taxes? How are we keeping our government like? Going after this homeowners heavy. Well, um, the the land for Emerald Village uh, will be placed in a community land trust, uh, so that is not taxable. Um, we expect that uh, the residents will have to pay tax on their units, but if you're in something that's fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, that tax is going to be very small. And in fact, we actually encourage that. We want to really give the image that these folk are becoming part of our, they are part of our community, they're giving back, um, you know, they're tax-paying citizens. So they will have a very tiny tax that they'll pay if we, yes. we hope. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
my question is, how did you address the different obstacles of infrastructure, the sanitation, sewage, you know, water, all of that kind of electricity? Yeah. What do sure. you do and what don't you do? Yeah, in each in each program, it's different. You know, so on the car camping program, it varies on what if the site provides it. At our church, we provide electricity um, and porta potties. Uh, some sites don't even provide electricity. They all have to provide a porta potty and access to garbage. Um, the rest stops have, have no utilities, zero. So what the city has allowed, even though in the boundaries of Eugene you cannot have open pit fires, <coughs> they allow them to have uh, an outdoor fire just for warmth and cooking and the like. Um, at the village, uh, there's utilities in, in our yurt. Uh, we, in fact, we have internet, full internet service, Wi-Fi, uh, in the yurt and heat. We have an outdoor kitchen with pantries that have electricity and refrigerators and ovens and microwaves, uh, but all the cooking is done outside under a, a covered area. The bathhouse is heated, um, fortunately. It has hot water, um, two flush toilets. And so, at any rate, um, you know, there's access to utilities in the village just not in the individual units. In Emerald Village, you will have full utilities. Each of those units will have full utilities. Yes, in the back. Uh, question about site selection. Um, how close was Opportunity Village to a center of commerce? And how did you uh, prepare and react to uh, for a neighborhood resistance? Right. So it's in a light industrial area. The property was purchased by the city to expand their public works department. So our neighbors are the public works on one side and the police forensic station on another side. Um, but across from us, across the road, there is a, uh, a wholesale house for plum plumbing. And then there are some residences just down the street. Um, we went to the neighborhood association as soon as we identified this property as a good site at two different meetings with the Neighborhood Association, um, and, and particularly with that business neighbor. And so conversation with him, because he was very fearful that it was going to increase crime. He says they get things stolen out of their yard all the time. Um, they now say they've had zero problems. Uh, uh, the police love us. Uh, well, in fact, the police don't like us because we don't give them any business. <laughs> and they're not coming out there, you know, so they're worried for their jobs. But uh, <laughs> seriously, they, they really do. They do like us. Um, uh, but at any rate, uh, when we, we had to go, unfortunately, we had to go through a conditional use permit process because it was zoned uh, for a different purpose. And we had, it was a long, drawn-out process. And when we went before the hearings official, there was no opposition. And the hearings official granted us immediate occupancy with no conditions whatsoever. Um, so, it, you know, just doing that kind of grassroots work to make sure you have conversation with your neighbors. For Emerald Village, we've had already three meetings with the neighborhood um, and have been working with them very closely. We've modified our plan, actually, to accommodate concerns of the neighborhood, but assured them that they will have a seat at the table in selecting who the residents are. Uh, so they'll get, you know, something you don't get with any other neighbor, you know, and some of those next to you. Yes. Back in the back. Hi. This is all really impressive. I think what it struck me the most so is a little loud. We the self-governance. I think that was really impressive. Um, and, and I think an important part of community building, and that is probably what's lacking in a lot of the homeless lives. And um, I wonder, are are, uh, is this being used in other applications, this model? The reason I ask is, um, as a senior woman, starting to look at other seniors who might group together and do something like this, um, I just wondered, do you think this is a model that could have other applications? Well, I definitely think it could be used. And again, Andrew Heben's book, uh, Tent, City, Tent City Urbanism, uh, you know, talks about the different models of tent cities where it's used. Um, we are, we're already looking down the road. Uh, we are thinking about building a facility for seniors using the tiny house concept. Uh, we want to do another one for veterans and another one for women who are survivors of domestic violence. Um, so 
talk to me again in a couple of years and I can tell you, but I, but I think certainly, yeah, these are concepts that could be used with other communities. Well, you put so much thought into all of this thing. It's just it's really impressive. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, as you describe all of your efforts, one of the things that seems to be is you're dealing with a fairly small group of people. Have you done some thought about what the, I assume you have, what the optimum size is and you don't want to get too big? So what kind of size limits do you see? And then the second question I have is, have you been able to get insurance companies to insure you? Yes. So yes, we have. Um, uh, we were fortunate to find a, a, a broker that was willing to work with us, so we haven't had any problem with insurance. Um, size. When we began this, because of the need, we were talking about a village of 200 people. I am so glad we did not do that. <laughs> um, I would, you know, anyone doing this, there is a project being developed in Texas by a group called Loaves and Fishes. Um, that they are talking about a, a larger um, village than, than we are, but they have staffing. It's a $2 million project or something. And I think with adequate staffing, you might be able to do something larger. Uh, but under the self-governed model, I would not recommend anything bigger than 30, uh, in that neighborhood, 30, 35 people. Uh, what we find is there's a huge diversity among the homeless population. It's just huge. And you get people with all kinds of skills and abilities, and you get people with all kinds of personalities. And conflict is inevitable. And the larger your group, the more conflict you're going to have. And so keeping it to a certain size, I think, helps keep it more manageable just to enable them to work through those conflicts. Um, so I think this size, but then I don't have, well, we have experience with our rest stops that are 20, and the village that has about 34 or 35. Um, and then and then our car camping program even smaller yet. But I have found this size to be very workable because it gives you the minimum you need in order to do things like manage the front gate. Um, you, you need just a certain number of folks to be able to do that. Uh, but it's not so many that it becomes unmanageable. So, so our plan is rather than to grow the village is to create more villages. And in fact, the the, the immediate plan is by building permanent housing, we will free up beds at Opportunity Village so that we can move more people in. And the hope is, is that Opportunity Village then becomes the feeder, so to speak, into the permanent housing as we bring people off street, particularly those who have been chronically homeless, and have to get folk kind of re-cultured to living in the community and how to work together with one another. And, and then that prepares them then for the permanent housing that hopefully we won't have to build too many of these uh, emergency shelter programs We can fo focus on building permanent housing. But we do have plans to at least duplicate it uh, at least once. Um, uh, and so we'll see. But, but I would do it that way. Multiply them rather than expand. I'd like to ask a question again. You, have, you mentioned two uh, mental health conditions. You mentioned addictions or alcoholism. You mentioned PTSD. What kind of interaction do you have with social services? So, uh, quite a bit, but we need to do more, frankly, and that's been something that we've been working on to expand. Um, there's a couple of different agencies in our community that, uh, one in particular, it's called Whitebird, that sends a staff person uh, to do the uh, transition plan of each of our villagers. And someone who's a social worker and trained in that sits down with each villager, figures out what their transition plan, gives them some keys, and that person, in fact, has uh, been instrumental in helping two of our villagers get housing. Um, so in doing that uh, kind of, of, of collaboration, and then also we work with some other agencies on conflict resolution, helping teach villagers conflict resolution skills, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. <coughs> okay. My guess is that this is better than what's available in many surrounding areas. Do you have any concerns about people being attracted to come to the community for this training and right? Is there a requirement for people to be, have been part of the community for some period of time before they're going to 
there certainly is a perception in our community that because we have so many services that we attract the homeless. I think it's more likely just a geographical thing, being on the I-5 corridor, there's just a lot of traffic up and down the corridor. We track, as the county, uh, and you probably have here too, it's something called HMIS, Homeless Management Information Services. Um, it's a program mandated by HUD. And every person that comes in to seek service, food box, uh, help with finding shelter, whatever the case, goes through that system. And we know 72% of the people that are homeless in our county had a residence in the county before they became homeless. 9% um, came from out of state, uh, something like 12% came from somewhere else in Oregon, and then 7% refused to answer the question. But, but you know, still, you have 70, you know, three fourths of your people basically uh, were residents when they became homeless. Now, what creates the impression that they come from other areas is that they speak with a southern accent. But they didn't come here, you know, just as an example, or Boston or something. You know, they came to Oregon because they had family, because they had a job prospect, and then they became homeless. Um, will we attract people with this? As, I mean, we have not seen that yet. Our hope is that we will build these in other communities so that, you know, they won't just be coming to Eugene. I mean, that's our goal, to really uh, grow this. I'm doing a TED Talk, actually TEDx, uh, the uh, Oregon version of TED. Uh, actually on this Saturday about this whole concept and, and Ted really pushes you, you're not about selling your organization, you're about selling the concept and, and hopefully that that will span others, you know, uh, to really get other communities to do the same thing so that, yeah, the one will come to you. That would be our hope. But I'm not concerned about it, but I know others are. Okay. I just had a question. Stand up, please. Of how many people are in Eugene, and tell me again what the population approximately is of the Sure. Eugene itself is about 160,000. The metropolitan area is closer to a quarter million. Uh, the homeless population is, a, is uh, the one night count is 1,500, right around 1,477. Uh, and about half of those were chronically homeless. Um, and about 60% of those were on shelter. I have a, I did a spreadsheet of all what's called continuum of care. Every uh, HUD requires us to work in these organizations to collaborate and work together, and it's called continuum of care. And each continuum of care region has to report on their one night homeless count or funny bank count, and as I said, every two years. I put that all into a spreadsheet, put in the populations, you get a per capita rate, Turns out Eugene has the highest per capita homeless outside of Florida, California, and Hawaii. We are 19th in the nation for unsheltered, I'm sorry, unsheltered homeless. Uh, total sheltered, I think we are 60th in the nation. Uh, so we, we definitely, and so when people think that we attract the homeless, I said, why would a homeless person come to a community that does such a lousy job providing shelter, right? <laughs> Uh, they do much better in any other area of the country except for California, Florida, and Honolulu. I was just curious as to where you're getting all of your graphics in the homeless population. I think you mentioned it. Um, beyond the point in time count, what is the total homeless population in the state? Is it around 100,000? Besides the point in time that, that I know of, if there is one, please call me. The continuum, the continuum, the, the continuum of care, but it's probably several yes, counties. Yeah. 14, yeah. 14 yeah. counties in your continuum of care. Yeah. yeah, so it's right. All of Southern Illinois. When I look, I did look at the spreadsheet before I came here, and yeah, Southern Illinois was one continuum. There are 21 states. Yeah. So, so it seems like we're moving the target, and it we is. don't have a really good grasp on it, which is part of the problem with moving forward. Well. Sure, and it's even more complicated that the definition has changed. So HUD just recently changed the definition of chronically homeless. So, and that just happened in a recent point in town account that chronic homeless means someone who has been homeless for one year or four times in the previous three years and 
has another presenting condition, either an addiction, mental illness, a disability. So in other words, if you don't have any other, other condition and you've been homeless for four times in the previous three years, you're not chronically homeless. Don't ask me why. It makes no sense, but that's their definition. Yes. Yes. At what point do you just stop and approach the city council and begin to pick a site? And just no more meetings, no more nothing, no more talking. You approach the CPD, you approach everyone of whom you really don't want to. At what point do you do it? So my advice to you is, uh, you know, build a coalition like you're already doing. Get the, the partners that are well respected in your community. Uh, find, you know, some leaders who are fairly well known and trusted by your community council, uh, your, your council and then present them with a plan. You've got to give them a vision of what you're going to do on this site. Now, whether it be the car camping or the rest stop or the village concept, whichever one you decide is most doable for you, but give them a vision that you have thought it through, you've got your people in place, and ask them to identify the public-owned properties that meet a certain criteria. Uh, and this is what we did. We said, we want one acre of land owned by uh, the city uh, that's on a bus line. Um, what was our other criteria? And fairly well-defined borders. And city staff came up with a list of six properties that met that definition. Uh, it turned out three of them were just horrible because there was no access, vehicle access to them. One of them was City Hall that was about to be torn down. <laughs> And, and the other site was the site we actually had, uh, were, were gunning for, but the NIMBY syndrome in, the, in that particular site was just huge. And they, they came up with this site that we're now on. And it's been a real blessing. It's a perfect site for us. It's worked really well. But so to go to your city council with all of that thought out, you present it in writing. This is our plan. These are the people. So you show them that you've really got it together. And you apply the public pressure to get them to do that. Uh, I, I did look at the total state. I know Chicago it's it's pretty high, but because Chicago is so cold right in the winter, uh, the ranking of unsheltered homeless is very low. So Chicago has a lot of shelters. The biggest one is the Cook County Jail. But other than that, uh, other than that, um, they do have a lot of shelters. Um, I, and when I looked at the numbers for Southern Illinois, I thought it was somewhere in the 300 people, if I recall, do you happen to know, that, uh, for Southern Illinois? Which, my gosh. I would suspect that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that's only in a point in time. Yeah. In, in, in our area, we know that there are 10 to 12,000 people who will become situationally homeless during the year. Um, uh, so there are a lot more folk at risk of becoming homeless at any given time. And it's important to get to those folks quickly uh, to really get them back on their feet. So I don't know. Well, I can tell you, I, I did the ranking of the top uh, 150, I think it was, and you weren't on it. Uh, but that was only because, uh, you, actually, it was because I stopped at all communities below 700, and you were below that. So I don't know what your per capita ranking would be. Sam, 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 please. That gets us to the question about those at great risk of homelessness. Yes. People who are, I mean, we talk a lot about a person being one paycheck away from being homeless. And so where does that population fit into those who qualify for the program? So I can tell you that um, in these, these statistics just came out this summer. One out of four renters pay half of their income <coughs> to their rent. And anything over 30% is considered burdensome. So if you're paying half of your rent, half of your income to rent, you are at risk. And if you are on minimum wage, 70% of the people on the federal minimum wage pay half of their income to their rent. They are all at risk. Um, that's 11 million Americans. Do you just on that, on that level. Do, does someone have to be on the street to qualify? No, in fact, we have decided at Emerald Village we are going to dedicate one-third of the project to people at risk 
who live in that neighborhood. That was one of the our compromises with the neighborhood that we were going to bring in a lot of homeless people. We'll say, hey, we'll make one third your own neighbors. And 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 we know there's going to be a long list that jumping at the chance to live in a smaller place that's nicer and that they have ownership of. Yeah. And can't afford, and it's half of what they're paying currently. Our rent started six hundred dollars. I'm going to call on people yeah. who have not had a chance to answer a question, unless no one does, and I'll answer that. Could you stand up, please? When you're determining the people that will go into the tiny houses and into the communities, how are you kind of determining who would be like sex offenders, felons, um, violent history, violent past? Because these are some of the hardest. Yeah. House. We fortunately we have a very good program for ex offenders in our community called Sponsors, and they are right now building their own complex. So that kind of takes the pressure off us to have to do that. Um, uh, we will not automatically exclude someone because of, a, of a, something that appears in there. We will do background checks, but what we will do is we'll ask, okay, what was the offense? You know, was it a serious felony or something not as serious? Even if it was a sex offense, is it pre uh, predatory in nature versus opportunistic? And you just kind of evaluate it on a case by case basis. Yeah. But there are laws where it's irrelevant what the sex offense was. You can't live within so many hundred feet. Of right, the law. right. If there's a school, school, yeah, right. Daycares, whatever. And that may come into play. I, we have a new facility just down the street from us. It's actually built for foster kids who have turned 18 and have to leave their home. Yeah, yeah, and then that's what we had going through. So if they're 18, that wouldn't apply, is that right? No, I don't think it would. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, yes. Is there any help for me? Uh, did you get any kind of grants? Uh, we have gotten a couple of grants, small grants. Uh, Oregon Community, uh, no, uh, Collins Foundation in uh, in Oregon, uh, gave us a grant. We got a, a small grant from a bank. Uh, oh, we got specifically uh, referring to HUD. Oh, to HUD. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, not yet. Uh, we will <coughs> apply at some point, not for this project, uh, but our plan is once we build this and we demonstrate to HUD that it meets all of their criteria, uh, yeah, most definitely. We, the issue there is we don't want to take away any money from family housing. So that would be our concern. So we have to be a little bit careful about that because I know the competition for those dollars is pretty steep. And, and, and we don't want, but we would like to get you know, a small piece of the pie. Uh, the state of Oregon, just in the last legislature, passed a measure to add $60 million in housing projects um, that's going to be funded through a bond. Uh, and that money won't become available until 2017. So we're trying to line ourselves up for some of that money because it's new money, so it won't feel like we're taking it away from anyone else. Do you want to ask a second question? Okay, here we go. Ella? Uh, as I understand it, reduced indoor space leads to increased outside activity. Uh, Eugene is probably the kind of community that has many resources. Or did you experience any strain on the community related to people being outside so much of the time? Yeah. So, no, in fact, so the question is, is since you have such small inside space, you're going to spend more time outside. Right. And what has happened at Opportunity Village is they've developed these nice little areas where they sit outside and visit with one another. And they've... We actually have two little cliques, so I'm not too happy about but we've got the front camp and the, and the back camp, and where they each have their kind of little, their smoking area, plus they're not allowed to smoke in any of the uh, units, so they have their little smoking area, and they've really created this, yeah, this community space. Um, uh, and you saw the picture of the yurt, it's the large, it's a 30-foot yurt, so it, we have about 40 people in those meetings in that yurt. At Emerald Village, it'll be the same thing. We are intentionally designing space as community space, gathering space. Um, so it's designed to be yeah, more outdoor living with your indoor bedroom, basically, where you sleep. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. what are your criteria for admission? I mean, you talk about 30 people in Opportunity Village. You're going to have to limit who can come to Emerald Village. 
how's that decided about who comes and what are the criteria? Yeah, there'll be an application process. Um, one of the criteria, uh, well, so we'll have two groups basically. Uh, those uh, units dedicated for residents of the neighborhood, and then those folk who uh, have come out of homelessness. So one of the criteria is is that you have been in a program that you have completed successfully, either Opportunity Village or Shelter Care or one of the or the Mission. Uh, any program in our community that is uh, working to transition people out. So that's the first criteria. Second, that you uh, show an ability to work together in community um, and to be able to work with others. And uh, Because that's really key in this concept. It's not your own little house all by yourself. It's house within a community. And so we need to have folks who can do and get along with each other. It doesn't mean they have to be an extrovert and, you know, that kind of person that's constantly working with others, but they have to be able at least to get along uh, with their neighbors. Uh, so that's key. And then there'll be an interview process. We'll have a, a, a small committee that will interview all of those folks. We'll look at you know, their performance record and whatever program they were in, reference checks and all of that. And what about for Opportunity Village? So an Opportunity Village, uh, we have a resident, we have a vetting committee of villagers themselves with one board member. And those villagers, there's again an application process, um, and those applications are really, we make them as simple as we can. Um, and uh, we invite people in for an interview, and they meet with that vetting committee. And so that vetting committee basically makes their decision based on how well they have a sense that this person is going to fit in the village, and how well they can get along. Our biggest challenge has been people with severe mental illness. And we've taken in a couple, and, and in most cases, it's not ended well. Um, and so that's been kind of a learning experience that even though we want to do the right thing without having trained people to work with folks with severe mental illness, it is not a community that works well uh, uh, for those folks. Um, it might be a project down the road that we figure out how to design one that's designed to do that. Um, but so we need folks that are going to be fairly self-functioning, can take some leadership roles, can do their chores, show a little bit of initiative. Yeah, and they, they're a better judge. I've taken people to the village I thought would be a great fit, and they look at that person and say, now that person's a meth addict. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I take one more question? I don't think we're, we're nice to my own kind of ignorance. I don't see ethnic diversity. Do you know how many black people from our community are? Not very many. Yeah, it's it's really sad. Our our African American no no seriously our African American population is like two percent. Uh, uh, the largest uh, community of color is Hispanic, and that's about twelve or thirteen percent. And I, we could have a long conversation of the historical reasons for that and. Our community agonizes over that and tries really hard to be you know, yeah, yeah. and, and we do have, uh, we, the president of NAACP is on our board of advisors. Um, and so we're working, and then we also have a, a woman from the Hispanic community and, and a gentleman from the Muslim community on our board of advisors to try to figure out how do we make sure that we're doing a good job of reaching out to uh, other communities <coughs> uh, with this program to invite them to be a part of it. Yeah, Native Americans. Yeah, we got a fair number. Uh, would you like to make an announcement? Yeah. You guys have a question, or do you have an announcement? The, uh, the call for items that we are collecting for homeless people, there are more copies of the circulation desk, so you can grab a copy as you need. Okay, so we're going to close, and I know there are probably many more questions that people have about public <coughs> Carbondale. It's great to talk about Eugene, Oregon. Uh, so if you have a few minutes, and if you'd like several of us who are on the Spanish Coalition, we'd be happy to answer a few questions. We have to close in about 15 minutes, because we're always closing. But we're first to go one more. Okay, so what, how can we go about getting a coffee at tonight's summer? It's going to be, Peter, do you want to answer that question? She said, how can we get a copy of tonight's seminar? Uh, probably should. He's cracked. <laughs> you have to wait for him to come around the corner. Uh, we do have a website and we have a Facebook page. And you can join us. You can fetch a 
lot of good information that's coming through the Facebook page. The Sparrow Coalition's website is www.sparrowcoalition.org, and we are updating it constantly. We have a section in there about the budget crisis. We're actually tracking the loss of services in this area. So if you want to see what's happening as a result of the budget impasse in Springfield, you can track what we're losing. Peter? Uh, I don't think it's going to be in the next week or two days. So much the Coalition Watch our website and look for updates on there. We, uh, Peter is uh, with the uh, Civic Soul and Imagining Geographies project, and he's going to be helping us out. I want to thank Hassan for getting out of his sick bed. He's a student uh, coming to help us with the video. He's fully volunteering tonight. But we will be posting more and more information for you. And I just want to let you know that um, if you are on the uh, email newsletter uh, listing that came on, then we will let you know via that newsletter when the video is available, as well as what we're up to and how you can get involved locally and that's just what i think we hope to spend a little bit more time talking about the sparrow coalition but i'm kind of glad that we did it so that we could get the full benefit of dan bryant's visit if you want to learn more about us you can um, read a little bit about us on the website sparrowcoalition.org what i would really like to talk about before you leave is how you can get involved in what we are doing right now um, this would be a great time to get involved as we are starting our second phase. We have four teams that are, for, are in formation now. Um, one is looking at this winter. Winter is coming. What, how are we going to respond? Another is looking at long-term initiatives like housing. What would be, what would be this community most benefit from? Um, there's also a communications team and a knowledge team that's working with our, between partners. And how do we share that information among our community and among um, one another um, relevant information? I have sign-up sheets for those teams. I will put them on the table right there. And as you're leaving, you can take a look at them and sign up if you'd like to. I also have a sheet. If you're available just for tasks here and there, if you can't commit to a committee, but there is some way you could help out with an event like this, perhaps. Um, I also want to say, you know, we're new, and we are so excited to be able to do something and feel like we are um, going slow, even though it just started in February. You know, we have, we have such energy, and I think we really need to capitalize on that energy and start moving forward what, what would be best for our community. I think some people have to misunderstanding that we're already an organization of 501c3 and can receive donations and we're just really a startup initiative but we have a long-standing program here good samaritan house is losing funding from state government if you want to make a donation see my key because they could certainly use the money thank you so much for coming